Well, as always, I would invite you to turn to open your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 19, verses 11 to 22. We are making our way through the book of Acts, and we, we have landed on a fascinating passage of Scripture. So allow me to read from verse 11 of Acts chapter 19. So brothers and sisters, this is God's holy and inerrant word. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims, Seven sons of the Jewish high priest named Sepha were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. And now after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent, and having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. Thus far the reading of God's word. Well, today's text is a bit of, sort of bizarre at least to the modern mind. Because in North America, we may not be used to the idea of exorcism and, or maybe even demon possession, unless you're into watching those horror movies uh, that talk about those things. But my closest experience with this whole notion of exorcism was actually back in 2014, uh, when I was house-sitting with a friend and then one night, very, one night, my friend was attending his church, and I was, I don't know where I was, I was, I was either at home or at church here. He actually called me one night, and he asked me if he could bring home a man who just got a demon driven out of him. Now, this happened in Vancouver, just FYI. Now, I'm not sure if you can imagine my initial reaction when I heard the news that this man was demon-possessed. I was certainly shocked and astonished. And of course, I was not comfortable with that idea of bringing a stranger home, but I just went along the ride. And so thankfully, my friend returned home with another friend who was pretty athletic, very buff, uh, very muscular, so he was able to watch over us, protect us, and also with a man who was possessed by the demon. So thankfully, nothing bad happened, all went well. So, praise the Lord for that. But truth be told, I was not physically present when they were casting a demon out of him. So I did not have a, really a direct experience with that. Nonetheless, even though I did not have a direct experience with that, we must remember that Scripture is our authority. Scripture is our authority, not necessarily our experience. Because our statement of faith as part of the Fellowship Baptist Church, teaches that Scripture is the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and uh, opinions should be tried. And so, as we think about this topic, what does the Scripture teach about demons, and, and demon possession, and even should Christians be involved with exorcism? But let me first and foremost, and say, first and foremost say this, is that we must understand that demons are evil spiritual forces. 
And the Bible uses different terminologies to refer to demons, like deceiving spirits, lying spirits, evil spirits,、uh, and harming spirits, and so forth. And also, Paul would describe them as authorities and cosmic powers and spiritual forces of evil in Ephesians chapter six. Another thing is that both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, they talk about demons. But it's mentioned a lot more in the new than the old. When you read the Gospels, Jesus and the apostles had multiple interactions with demons and demon-possessed people. Another thing is what you got to know about demons is that they're actually not more powerful. They're not power more powerful than God, nor are they more powerful than born-again Christians. See, the demons cannot do anything apart from the sovereignty of God. See, God allows demons to do their work for the purpose of accomplishing His sovereign plan. And furthermore, demons do not have the power and authority over any true followers of Jesus Christ. They don't, and it is impossible for demons to possess any believers in the Lord. It's impossible. Why is that? Was、well, because the Scripture says that we have God, the Holy Spirit, living in us. First John chapter five verses, chapter five verse eighteen says that we know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. And so, what should be, what should our involvement be with exorcism? Should we be casting out demons in our day? Well, you will have to pay attention, as I will answer that question somewhere in the sermon. But as we come back to this passage in Luke chapter、uh, Acts chapter nineteen, Luke packs this passage with a lot of interesting topics and themes. See, not only does he talk about demons, but also magic. And this is the third time in the book of Acts that, Lord, that Luke records for us the concept of magic. You see, you see that in verses seventeen to to twenty, when all those folks in the residents of Ephesus they burn. Their magic books. So this is the first time they talk about magic, and we remember back in Acts chapter eight, this is the first time people that would talk that would, were exposed to magic.、Uh, Acts chapter eight tells us about the man by the name of Simon the magician. He was supposedly practicing magic in Samaria, and he also wanted to offer the apostles money in order to in order to purchase the power of the Holy Spirit. And the second time we are told about magic or magicians is in Acts chapter thirteen, which was the beginning of Paul's first missionary journey, and he went to the island of Cyprus, and there he encountered another magician by the name of Bar Jesus or Elymas. Now, as Paul is in Ephesus, sorcery and wizardry were more pervasive in the city. Why is that? See, last Sunday I explained the history and the significance of Ephesus. So allow me to give give you a further cultural background of Ephesus. See, Ephesus was also known for its magnificent temple of Diana and or Artemis, and this temple will actually be explained further when we get to Acts nineteen verses twenty three to forty one with the whole riot. But what you should know is that the temple was the center of much superstitious religion and cult prostitution, and so magic arts,、uh, exorcism, paganism, occult occultism,、uh, incantation are not uncommon in Ephesus. It's actually a normal part of their life. One scholar notes this, and I quote: "Of all ancient Greco-Roman cities, Ephesus, the third largest city in their empire." Was by far the most hospitable to magicians, sorcerers, and charlatans of all sorts. End quote. And so, with that in mind, Paul. We learned last week that Paul encountered three groups of people in Ephesus earlier in the chapter. We were, we remember the the oblivion the obliviousness of the disciples, the obstinacy of the Jews, and the open open mindedness of the crowd. And now we'll learn two more groups of people in Ephesus. So third, and that is the occultism, the occultism of the Jewish exorcists. 
the occultism of the Jewish exorcists. Luke describes something odd here in verses 11 to 12. He says that God was doing extra miracle, extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. Now these miracles were so odd to the point that even handkerchiefs or aprons that touch Paul's skin would be carried away and cure the citizens who are suffering with diseases and possession of evil spirits. But notice that Luke says extraordinary in verse 11. Extraordinary. And this word can, can literally be translated as miracles not experienced or not obtained. See, unusual miracles in the, happen in the Bible, but they're very rare. They're usually just a one-off event, and we're not told if that happened again. There are two examples of two extraordinary miracles. You may remember in Mark chapter 5, in the life of Jesus, that the woman was healed by touching the fringe of Jesus' garment. And then in 2 Kings chapter 13, a rather obscure passage, we're told about a dead man. A dead man was thrown into the grave of Elisha. And as soon as he touched the bones of Elijah, this dead man was resurrected. He revived and he stood on his feet just by touching the bones of Elisha. But sometimes this whole entire extraordinary miracle can lead to superstitions. See, in the case of Acts chapter 5, the apostles were performing signs and miracles to point, that, to point people, uh, to, point people to, to follow Peter. And what happened is that these people carried the sick into the street, and, to, and they thought that Peter's shadow would somehow heal them. See, the Luke, Luke, the author, was a physician in training. And he was also a physician in, with experience. And he did not discount or dismiss ordinary miracles. He actually faithfully recorded for us what happened in this story in Acts 19. See, Paul, he did not ultimately have the power to do the miracles. Only God did. And Paul would have performed miracles in the name of the Lord Jesus. And furthermore, Paul was so filled with the Holy Spirit that when handkerchiefs and or aprons had physical contact with him, sickness, diseases, and evil spirits went out of people. And I would think that the Apostle Paul, he may not even have known that those materials that touch his skin somehow cure people. Now, why was God particularly doing extraordinary miracles in Ephesus? Even though the text does not explicitly state the reason, one possible reason is because Ephesus was a city known for its paganism and magic arts and superstition. And so God was doing extraordinary miracles to Paul to confirm that his message was indeed authentic as an apostle. And in God's wisdom, it might also be that these miracles may have been necessary to appeal to such a superstitious city like Ephesus. It was also to show that the God whom Paul preached is the true God who can sovereignly perform miracles instead of trusting in these Jewish exorcists and the magic arts. And so now in verses 13 to 14, Luke introduces us to these itinerant Jewish exorcists. Now you may have heard, you may have heard the word exorcism, so let me just kind of define what it is. It means driving out evil spirits by invoking the name of a more powerful spirit being. So for example, you may have heard or seen in movies or shows where an exorcist would say to a demon-possessed person, the power of Christ compels you. I don't know what that really means. So, uh, But here, Luke doesn't offer us the names of these exorcists. We don't know their names. But what we are told is that they are the sons of a Jewish high priest named Sipha, and there were seven of these sons, seven of them. We don't know too much about Sipha since he's only mentioned here. It's more likely he had, that he has no connection to the, to the high priestly family in Jerusalem since Ephesus was far away. Instead of being high priest, some translators would translate this as being the chief priest the chief priest in Ephesus. 
But what you need to know about these exorcists, these seven exorcists, is that they were fake and that they were charlatans. They're itinerants that go from place to place, wandering around the region of Asia Minor. And in the ancient world, they did not perform exorcism for service, per se. They did it in order to profit something, to get something out of it. Much like many of the so-called faith healers of our day, like Benny Hinn and Todd White. They claim to be healing people from sickness, but they fail to provide evidence from medical documents. Those who were supposedly healed were actually stage actors, not the real sick people. And so you have to be very careful. You have to be very careful of, of, of those who claim to be healers and they claim to know Jesus, but in reality, they're spiritual con artists and false teachers. These Jewish exorcists must have observed that Paul casted out the evil spirits in the name of Jesus. And so they're trying to do the same thing. They're trying to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who have evil spirits. Those who are possessed by demons by saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. However, when examining what they said, there seems to be two mistakes that these exorcists made. First, you need to know, notice this verb, adjure. Adjure. And this word adjure means to ask someone to promise that they are telling the truth or that they will do what they are asked to do. In other words, they are to take an oath. They are to take an oath. It is, it's not surprising that these exorcists use the word adjure, trying to tell them to take an oath, because the word exorcism in the Greek derives from the word oath. So they're trying to bind this demon with an oath. And so what's the problem here? What's the mistake here? Jesus and the apostles never used that language to cast out demons. So what makes them think that they have the power and authority of using that language? The second mistake you need to notice is that is you need to notice what grammarians call the definite article. The definite article. You know, there's a and there's the for, for something. So they said the Jesus. Notice. The Jesus. Not just Jesus. It's as if they're using the Jesus as a magic word or a formula with the addition of whom Paul preaches in order to cast out demons. They're using the name of Jesus not because they knew him, but because they think that they can get something out of it. Remember, their motivation was not to offer service, but to receive some sort of gain. Simon the magician, who tried to gain power by, by they, he tried to gain power by buying the Holy Spirit. So in a similar way, they try to, these exorcists, they try to tap into the power of Jesus' name when they have yet to truly believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior. Some folks who go to church may be similar to the sons of Sipha. They treat God as a means to an end. They treat him in a way to benefit their lifestyle and to satisfy their selfish desires. They treat the name of Jesus or even Christian accessories as, luck, as a lucky charm or a talisman that would bring good luck or health and prosperity. And also, let me just kind of briefly speak to the young people here in this church. Those of you who are young people or maybe you're young at heart, um, let me ask you a question. Are you a Christian? And if so, why are you a Christian? Are you a Christian just because your parents are Christians? Are you a Christian just because you go to church? Are you a Christian because you attend a Christian school? And imagine you, you were these exorcists and you said, I adjure you by the Jesus who my parents proclaim and believe. That's kind of a similar idea, right? It doesn't work like that. You cannot borrow your parents' faith. You cannot borrow Paul's faith in Jesus when facing spiritual warfare. You, your faith in the Lord Jesus is an individual experience because it's a relationship with him. 
You have to trust Him as your Lord and Savior if you have not done so. And so, having said that, how does the, Holy, uh, how does the evil spirit respond to these exorcists? Take a look at verses 15 to 16. We recall that the exorcists attempted to cast uh, multiple evil spirits, but there is the single evil spirit that responded. And this is probably the leader of the group of demons here. And he said to them, Jesus, I know. Paul, I recognize. But who are you? In other words, the demon knew who their enemies were, Jesus and Paul, and also followers of Jesus Christ. He was well aware of Jesus' power. And he was acquainted with the Apostle Paul because Paul received authority from the Lord Jesus Christ. However, while the exorcists may have been able to fool the gullible Ephesians, but they cannot fool the demon when he questioned them, Who are you? Who are you? The seven sons of Siva were no threat to a single demon. He didn't even know them. They're nobodies to him. In fact, they're nobodies to us. Because when we read this text, they don't, we don't even know their names. They're just a bunch of nobodies. The demon knew their spirit, the spiritual condition of the exorcist. He knew that they were charlatans for, because they did not have the right and the power to use Jesus' name. Nor did they have the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit with them. And so the exorcists were open to an attack by a demon-possessed man. And there are three verbs, you need to notice in verse 16. There are three verbs to describe the attack. And every verb is pointing to a goal. He, first, he leaped on them, which means he rushed and jumped on them suddenly. Second, he mastered all of them, which can also be translated as domineering. They're in, they're the, it carries the idea of subduing them and making them inferior. And third, finally, he overpowered them. See, le after leaping onto them and subduing them, they are then in control over them. See, another thing you want to know about someone who is demon-possessed is that he carries extraordinary strength. We recall in a story in the Jesus, in life of Jesus where in Mark chapter 5, uh, where nobody could bind a demon-possessed man with a chain. And even when he is chained, he is able to break the shackles in pieces and also says in the text that no one is able to subdue him. No one had the strength to subdue him except the Lord Jesus Christ. And what came out of this is quite humorous in some sense. What happened? They fled out of the house naked and wounded. They were humiliated. They brought themselves much shame as a result of their action, which also underscores their complete lack of success in trying to trick people. The Jewish exorcist unsuccessfully attempted to drive the demon out, but the demon was successful in driving them out of the house. And see, this story is a clear example of the risk associated with individuals, charlatans, who take on messianic or apostolic powers and attempt to deal with demons and Satan without fully understanding the consequences of meddling in the supernatural realm. And so what we have learned, the fourth group that Paul encountered in Ephesus, and that is the occultism of the Jewish exorcists. However, despite what happened to the sons of Sepha, it led to an unusual result as this news spread to all the residents of Ephesus and this is the final group that Paul encounters, and that is the overcoming of the residents of Ephesus. The overcoming of the residents of Ephesus. Now, what I mean by overcoming is that it brought some kind of revival or some sort of awakening. And the definition for revival simply means a spiritual reawakening in the life of a believer, when, where he or she was lacking in spiritual growth and spiritually dormanted, that is not growing at all. 
And we'll just see what that is in this section of this passage. You see, the embarrassing news of what happened to the sons of Sepha made headline in all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, through the word of mouth and eyewitness account. When they heard the news, fear fell upon all. And here's the good news. The name of the Lord Jesus was extolled, magnified, or exalted. Now it's unlikely, possibly, that there was a mass conversion in all the residents of Ephesus. It's more likely that there was an awareness and recognition to the power of the name of Jesus that Paul personally proclaimed. And they probably recognized that the name of Jesus was not to be used in an irreverent manner. And so in verses 18 to 19, many people, including believers, were shaken by what happened. And so the believers in verse 18 repented by openly confessing and divulging, or in other words, disclosing their practices like their magic arts. And then in verse 19, we also have a number of people, not sure if they're believers or, or maybe a mixture of both believers and non-believers, But either way, we're told that we have a number of people bringing their books together, and I suppose books that taught magic, and burned them in the sight of all. And the value of those books would come to 50,000 pieces of silver. Now, and it might have been equivalent to about 50,000 days wages of an average worker. So I was doing some sort of calculation this week, like how much would this cost? Um, what's the value of all these books in Canadian dollar? And so, since Ephesus is located in Turkey, uh, let's try to calculate the current minimum wage of Turkey and convert that to Canadian dollar, okay? So, so the minimum wage I've learned is, is in Turkey is 45 Turkey, Turkish dollars per hour, which would be about $3 per hour Canadian. And so if you do all of that, let's just say you work for eight hours a day. So three times eight, $24 Canadian. And then you multiply that by 50,000 days wages of an average worker. And so that is roughly at least $1 million Canadian. That's a lot of books in value. And so how come the believers here when we think about this passage, how come the believers here were still practicing magic arts? Why were they doing that still? Aren't they, look, aren't they followers of Jesus? Don't they know that this is not right? Well, assuming that they were new believers, it was not strange that many of them still practiced magic. Perhaps it was something that was hard for them to let go as, as a new believer. Uh, perhaps they were unknowingly adopting some form of syncretism. Now, if you don't know what the word syncretism means, it means blending or mixing, a, mixing different religions and beliefs. And it's some, somewhat very pervasive here in Vancouver with the interfaith movement or interfaith dialogue and the New Age movement. Uh, basically, a person who's, who practices syncretism would have a religious buffet taking Christianity and Hinduism and Buddhism, New Age, whichever religion, and adopting them into their lives. But biblical Christianity teaches and demands our undivided loyalty to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And these believers, after what happened, they recognized they did something wrong. And not only that, they were willing to repent of their practices, which demonstrate a genuineness of their faith. Think about that. When was the last time you openly confessed your sins and actually showed what sin you were actually committing? Now, the Lord knows, but imagine doing it in the sight of all. I wonder this morning if there are still idols and sin in your life that you are still holding on to. I wonder if you're flirting with demonic spirits in your life, playing with Ouija boards, tarot card or taking this personality test called Enneagram. Now, if you don't know what Enneagram is, it's like 
possible you've heard of it, but it's a, actually a per personality test that helps you understand your own human behavior and motivation by describing nine distinct personality types. But I want to, we don't have time to delve, delve, dive into that, but what you need to be cautious about and very careful with is that it has some sort of demonic origin. So be careful. So in verse 20, since the believers gave up their paganism and magic arts, what we see here is very marvelous. That is the word of God. The word of the Lord didn't decrease, but it continued to increase and prevail mightily. See, the evil one thought he prevailed by overcoming the Jewish exorcists, but the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ prevailed all the more mightily. And these believers were going to grow, and the gospel would continue to spread in Ephesus, and the gospel continues to have the power to prevail over those who are living in bondage to demonic powers. And Jesus continues to triumph over the devil by using this situation in Ephesus to advance the gospel and to purify and to sanctify his people, cause them to repent and turn from their idolatry. And so what happened in so what happened after in Ephesus after what happened in Ephesus? Paul makes, his, makes plans for his future travel in verses 21 to 22. Essentially, what you need to know about this passage is that this passage sets an outline for the rest of the book of Acts. If you read on ahead, after Paul leaves in Ephesus, he goes to Macedonia, he goes to Achaia, he goes to uh, Jerusalem, and eventually lands in Rome. But Paul also had other plans in Asia. So he stays in Ephesus for a bit longer while he sends his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, ahead of him. And so now, as he stays in Ephesus, we'll learn that he gets into a lot of trouble with the Ephesians. But you'll have to come back next time as we learn about the riot in Ephesus in verses 23 to 41. But I want to address this, que this big question. This theological and practical question, should Christians be involved in exorcism? Should Christians be involved in exorcism? Now here's my short and simple answer. Maybe. But I don't think you should. Are we satisfied? <laughs> Ready to move on? <laughs> but here's my long answer. For you to, for, just for your consideration, and really search the scriptures to make sure if what I'm saying is indeed true. Here's my long answer. When you look at the Gospels and Acts, Jesus and the Apostles had the authority to cast out demons. You could argue that there was this someone whom uh, the Apostle John took issues with in Luke chapter 9, uh, verse 49, who was casting out demons, apparently. But the main point of Luke chapter 9 wasn't so much that this someone who was a true believer, was able to cast out demon. See, Jesus allowed him to do it for a reason, and it was to teach the disciple a lesson on humility and the problem with sectarianism. And also that in the latter part of the New Testament, from Romans and onward, there seems to be a change in the way that spiritual warfare is discussed for the churches. Now, this doesn't dismiss the reality of demons roaming in our world. While we acknowledge them as active and present, there is no longer an emphasis on casting out demons of individuals. You would find it very difficult. In fact, I don't think you can find it in anything in the letters to churches that instruct Christians to cast out demons. Instead, believers are instructed by the apostles to put on the whole armor of God to resist them and to be cautious of their, of their influence and not allow them to have a foothold in our lives. See, the focus is standing against them rather than attempting to cast them out or try and perform exorcism. Furthermore, true spiritual warfare is a fight for the truth against the pervasive lies and falsehood in our world. Spiritual warfare is also proclaiming the gospel to lost sinners. Okay, remember, anybody who's demon-possessed, who professes to be demon-possessed, they're lost sinners. 
in need of Jesus Christ. And so our responsibility as Christians is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who are enslaved and shackled by their own sins, by the evil one, who continue to indoctrinate them with lies through evil and corrupt people. See, the book of Ephesians teaches us how to have victory over the forces of evil. It starts with having faith in Christ, which breaks the power of the evil one. And by God's grace, we're then commanded to put off ungodliness and to put on godliness, which involves renewing our minds. And afterward, uh, Paul reminds Christians that we are in spiritual battle, so we're given the whole armor of God. And God has given us what we need to stand against the trickery of the demonic world with the armor and a spiritual weapon, which is the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. We stand with truth, righteousness, salvation, God's Word, faith, and prayer against the enemies. And, and finally, as the Word of God was completed, Christians like us, we have the weapon to battle against the spirit world than the early Christians did. See, casting out demons in the New Testament is not so much emphasized, but rather it's actually evangelism, discipleship through the Word of God. Now, while the New Testament letters do not command or emphasize on exorcism, they don't necessarily forbid us to which is why my short answer was maybe, <laughs> but I don't think you should. See, since the methods of the spiritual warfare in New Testament don't seem to involve casting out demons, it is really difficult to really determine uh, the instructions of how to, you know, cast out demons if that were the case. So, for instance, do we just simply say, I cast you out in the name of Jesus? If so, how many times do I need to say that? Because when you actually look at Jesus in the apostles' life, how many, how many times do they need to say it? They only need to say it once. That's it. But what if it doesn't work for us for the first time? See, we're not called to be demon slayers. You're laughing because you know the TV show. Uh, but we're not called to be demon slayers. So it seems to, so it seems, the best way to cast out demons, quote unquote, cast out demons, and even those who say they are demon possessed, I think the best way is by exposing individuals to the truth of God's word. Exposing them to the gospel of salvation, the gospel of grace, and how they can be saved. And exposing them to the name of Jesus Christ more and more. It is only the gospel of Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection, that can rescue lost, wretched sinners from demonic possession and also demonic enslavement. Because every lost sinner, if you don't know Jesus Christ, you are enslaved by the evil one. And it's through Jesus' resurrection and death, death and resurrection, he disarmed the evil one and triumphed over them. So if you trust Jesus Christ, if you love him, and you obey him, you are no longer a slave to the evil one, but you belong to our loving and gracious Lord and Master Jesus Christ. So that's my long answer. Hope you can consider that. And so in summary, we learn two other groups that Paul encountered in this passage. And that is first, the occultism, uh, first, the obliviousness of the disciples, second, the obstinacy of the Jews, third, the open-mindedness of the crowd for today's passage, the occultism of the Jewish exorcists, and fifth, the overcoming of the residents of Ephesus. Now in conclusion, as we wrap up and get ready to celebrate and remember, and the Lord's Supper, this dramatic and outfit, almost humorous story where the demon recognized Paul and Jesus, it actually raises an important yet challenging question for you and also for us as a church. Do we walk closely enough with God that even the enemy recognizes us? Will the enemy say, Jesus I know, Paul I know, and I begin to recognize or even know those Christians at Oak Ridge Baptist Church? Or do we live in a state of spiritual dormant, 
without making much of an impact on the enemy. Or the enemy say, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? You don't scare me anyway. You're not even close to your savior. See, my concern is that too often Satan is not afraid of local churches and individual Christians because they're not walking closely with God. So brothers and sisters, are you aware of the reality of spiritual warfare? Do you know that the enemy is constantly on the move? And will you pick up the armor of God and stand firm against the schemes of the devil, of the evil one? But we can also take heart that Jesus has conquered them. So, if you, so that if you are in him, if you're in Christ, you have victory over them. And so may the Lord bless the preaching of his holy word. And may he teach you his ways so that you may walk in him, and walk in his word, and unite your heart to fear his name. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for this passage that is rather bizarre, yet challenging and important, practical, because it affects how we are to think about this whole idea of spiritual warfare. I do ask that you would help us wrestle with some of the things we heard, but also keep in mind that, that the evil one is always on the move trying to deceive, pull us away from you. But Lord, we know that for those of us who are in Christ, we're no longer enslaved to the evil one. We're no longer enslaved to our own sins. And so if there are those who don't know Christ in this room, if they have not trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior yet, I pray that you, they would recognize that, that they are enslaved by the evil one to do his biddings, because that is what we were doing before we came to know you. We were following the course of the evil one. But thanks be to Jesus, you came down to the world to save us, to rescue us from that bondage. And Lord, as we, as we are about to celebrate the Lord's Supper and remember what Jesus Christ has done for us, Lord, may this be a sweet reminder for us to renew our covenant relationship with you. If we have been far away from you, if we have not been, if we have been spiritually um, dormanted, lazy, not active, I ask that you, this, will you use this to, as a means of grace to cause us to repent, just like these folks in Ephesus, to confess their sins, and to even turn away, to burn any sort of idols that that is in our life. So God, I ask that you do your work in our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.